Qatar suspends mediation efforts on the Gaza conflict. WHO warns of imminent famine in Gaza. Hello, good afternoon and salam Malaysia Dani. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sahih Samshidin and you're watching World Today. Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim arrived in Cairo for a four-day official visit to Egypt at the invitation of Egypt's President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. The special flight carrying the Prime Minister and his delegation landed at Cairo International Airport at 6.30pm local time and was received by Egypt's Prime Minister Dr Mustafa Madbuli, Malaysian Ambassador to Egypt Dato Mohamed Tariq Sufyan and other officials. At the presidential arrival hall, the Prime Minister inspected the static guard of honour manned by 16 personnel. Accompanying the Prime Minister on this visit are Minister of Foreign Affairs, Datuk Sri Mohammad Hassan, Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry, Tunku Datuk Sri Zafrul Tunku Abdul Aziz, Deputy Minister of Energy Transition and Water Transformation, Akmal Nasrullah Mohammad Nasir, Deputy Minister of Natural Resources and Environment Sustainability, Datuk Sri Huang Tiang Si, and other officials. Later today, the Prime Minister is scheduled to receive an official welcoming ceremony at the al Ittihadiyah Palace before a private meeting with Al-Sisi, followed by a bilateral discussion between the two leaders. Meanwhile, Dr. Sri Anwar is scheduled to deliver a lecture at Al-Azhar Al-Sharif University in Cairo, Egypt, emphasising the empowerment of Muslims through technology, society and economy today. Dr. Sri Anwar will deliver a talk entitled Strong Together, Viewing the World of People from the Perspective of Technological, Social and Economic Empowerment at the world's oldest and most prestigious Islamic learning institution. Through a post on Facebook, al Azhar Al-Sharif University stated the event is aimed at celebrating the close relations between Malaysia and the Middle East leading university. Senior university management and foreign diplomats, expatriates and Malaysian students are expected to attend the talk. The Prime Minister is on a four-day official visit to Egypt starting Saturday until 12 November at the invitation of President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. The Malaysian ambassador to Egypt, Dato Muhammad Tariq Sufyan, said the visit will mark important history of the brotherly relationship between Malaysia and Egypt. The visit will also open up space to diversify and strengthen cooperation as well as strengthen the basis of synergy on efforts to examine various regional and global issues of mutual interest. On another matter, Dr. Sri Anwar expressed his sadness over the horrific bombing in Quetta, Pakistan, which has claimed the life of at least 24 people and left many others injured. In a social media platform, Prime Minister extended his condolences to the people of Pakistan who mourn this senseless and devastating loss. He also added that these acts of utter ruthlessness and violence targeting both civilians and security personnel are stark reminders of the relentless threat posed by extremism and ideological rigidity forces that undermine progress and peace in Muslim societies. He reaffirmed that Malaysia stands firmly in solidarity with the government of Pakistan in its steadfast fight against terrorism. Qatar says it has suspended its mediation efforts between Israel and Hamas until the parties show their willingness and seriousness to end the war in Gaza. In a statement on X, Qatar's foreign ministry spokesman Majid Al Ansari said Qatar had informed the relevant parties 10 days ago of its intentions. Early on Saturday, it was reported a diplomatic source as saying that Hamas' political office in Qatar no longer serve its purpose. However, Al Ansari said that reports regarding the Hamas' political office in Doha were inaccurate, stating that the main goal of the office in Qatar is to be a channel of communications between the concerned parties. A senior Hamas official said they were aware of Qatar's decision to suspend mediation efforts, but they were never told to leave. Qatar's announcement comes after growing frustration with the lack of progress on a ceasefire deal. 
There continued to be no end in sight to the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza and the Israel-Hezbollah war in Lebanon, where Israel's military claimed it struck command centres and other infrastructure overnight in Beirut's southern suburbs. In a related development, the Israeli military has killed several dozen Palestinians across the Gaza Strip in a string of attacks as it allowed a small amount of aid into the northern part of the enclave, first after a over a month of intensified siege. Medic said at least 40 people were killed across Gaza since dawn, including 24 in the north. At least six Palestinians were killed in the targeting of the Fat al-Sabah school, sheltering displaced people in the Tufa neighbourhood on Saturday. Two local journalists, a pregnant woman and a child, were among the dead. Five more were killed in the Shujaya neighbourhood of Gaza City, while Israeli sniper fired kill at least one person in the Zetun neighbourhood. The death toll from Israeli bombing of tents for displaced people in the so-called humanitarian area of Al Mawasi in southern Gaza's Khan Yunis reached at least nine. A child and two women were among the dead, according to the Nasir Hospital, which received the casualties. On the 400th day of the war on Saturday, the Gaza Ministry of Health announced that at least 43,552 Palestinians have been killed and 102,765 injured. The actual number of dead is presumed to be far higher, with an estimated 10,000 bodies buried under the vast rubble of destroyed buildings across the enclave. Meanwhile, protesters gathered in Tel Aviv on Saturday to mark 400 days since a war erupted on 7th October 2023, demand for ceasefire and the release of hostages. Protesters once more were demanding that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu secure a deal to release the hostages taken by Hamas, while others called for elections and for Netanyahu to step down. The crowd gathered, holding play cards, posters of hostages and chanting. Qatar's foreign ministry said on Saturday that its effort in mediating a Gaza ceasefire and hostage release deal between Israeli and Hamas were currently stalled. The Gulf state's efforts to broker a deal will resume when the parties show their willingness and seriousness to end the brutal war. According to the Palestine's health authorities on Saturday, Israel's unrelenting attacks on the Gaza Strip has killed 43,552 Palestinians and injured 102,765 others over the past 13 months. On a related note, the World Health Organization, WHO, warned about the escalating crisis in northern Gaza, noting that famine is imminent. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said findings from the Integrated Food Security Phase classification indicates that there is a strong likelihood that famine is imminent in areas within the northern Gaza Strip. WHO called for an immediate scale-up and safe access for humanitarian aid, primarily food and medicines for severe malnutrition within days, not weeks. Flouting a UN Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, Israel has continued its brutal offensive on the Gaza Strip since 7 October 2023. The Israeli onslaught has killed 43,550 Palestinians and injured 102,700 others. This is placing almost the entire population of the territory amid an ongoing blockade that has led to severe shortages of food, clean water and medicine. North Korea staged GPS jamming attacks for the second consecutive day Saturday. South Korea's military said this attack affecting several ships and dozens of civilian aircraft. Local media reported the jamming attacks were conducted in the North Heiju and Kaesong areas, warning vessels and civilian aircraft operating in the Yellow Sea to be cautious of the attacks. Meanwhile, military operations and equipment were not affected. The latest threat came three days after the South's military detected a similar movement on Tuesday. The GSP jamming attacks this week, however, involved a weaker signal compared with the multiple attacks the North conducted near the northwestern border areas between 29th May and 2nd June 2024. Coming up, pollution hits record levels in Lahore.
Guangxi, a stunning region in southern China, has captivated ASEAN Media participating in the 2024 ASEAN Media Partners Corporation Week with its breathtaking cast landscape. Let's take a look at a report from Pabao Jalbeta Robert from Gulin. We are currently on the river cruise traversing along the beautiful Lijiang or the Li River located some 30 kilometers away from central Guilin and it is famous for its rock formation that's been here for thousands of years. Just so you know that this beautiful place has been immortalized onto the 20 yuan node. We embark on a four-hour cruise to witness breathtaking limestone formations, including the iconic Nine Horses Mountain. This geological marvel showcases nine horse-shaped rock figures that have captured the imagination of local artists. Hari ini kami datang ke sini uh, dan menaiki cruise boleh menikmati pemandangan yang sangat indah. Sejak saya kecil saya pernah datang ke sini. Bapa saya bawa saya melancong ke sini dan pada masa itu air sungai masih sama dengan sekarang sebab uh, itu dilindungkan dengan sangat baik dan kali ini saya pun sangat gembira sebab saya Berperuang datang ke sini dengan rakan-rakan dari Malaysia, kami bersembang dengan sangat gembira. Our group visited the picturesque Yangshuo area, taking a leisurely bamboo raft ride down the Yulong River, surrounded by stunning camel-shaped limestone mountains. Yangshuo has recently introduced low altitude economy initiative, offering visitors unique aerial experiences like helicopter rides, hot air balloon flights, and paragliding. This government backed initiative aims to revitalize local economy, which was previously impacted by the pandemic. By harnessing technology to protect its stunning landscapes, Guilin is not only preserving its natural heritage but also positioning itself as a world-class tourism city with sustainability in mind. Jemita Robert, Guilin, RTM. Joe Biden and President-elect Donald Trump will meet on Wednesday at the White House on Biden's invitation following Trump's election win. Trump will take office on 20th January 2005 after defeating current Vice President Kamala Harris in the 5th November 2024 presidential election. Biden made the comments after he attended mass on Saturday during his weekend stay in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Biden had initially sought re-election but dropped out of the race in July after a disastrous debate against Trump. Trump was elected the 47th president of the United States on Wednesday, an extraordinary comeback for a former president. Britain's royal family attended the annual festival of remembrance at London's Royal Albert Hall on Saturday. The event marked Princess Kate's latest public engagement after undergoing preventive cancer treatment earlier this year. Kate wore a black dress adorned with a red poppy, a symbol of respect for those who have lost their lives in conflict. She was accompanied by her husband, Prince William, and other members of the royal family. They were followed shortly afterwards by King Charles, whose wife, Queen Camilla, had cancelled engagements as she recovers from a chest infection. Camilla hopes to return to public duties early next week. The ceremony at the Jacinto Path War Memorial is held on the nearest Sunday to 11th November to mark the end of World War I and pays tribute to those who lost their lives in conflict. Lahore, Pakistan's second largest city, was enveloped in thick smog on Saturday. The eastern Punjab province had taken precautionary measures by prohibiting entry to parks, zoos, playgrounds and various public spaces the day before in an effort to protect citizens from the harmful effects of polluted air. The provincial government was also considering closing down universities after shutting schools earlier this week. 
The air quality in Lahore has deteriorated drastically, earning Punjab's regional capital the rank of world most polluted city, according to Swiss air purification equipment maker. Punjab has attributed this year's particularly high pollution levels to the toxic air from neighbouring India, where air quality has also reached hazardous levels. Violent clashes erupted in downtown Valencia on Saturday as thousands of protesters confronted police during a rally demanding accountability for the government's response to recent deadly floods in eastern Spain. The protesters, organised by civil groups and union march from the city hall to Manises Square, criticising the government's delayed and ineffective response to the disaster that devastated parts of the Valencia province and affected around 80 municipalities. Police and protesters clash in Valencia following demonstration over deadly floods Valencia, Spain. Protesters gathered to voice anger over alleged mishandling of the crisis that claimed over 217 lives, clashed with officers in protective gear as tension escalated near the city hall square. As protesters marched, they also chanted for the resignation of Valencian government president, Halos Mazon, who they blamed for mishandling the emergency response. Police responded with crowd control measures as protesters threw chairs and other objects, igniting scenes of chaos amid the large-scale demonstration. The October floods left extensive destruction across roughly 80 municipalities, and protesters argue that a lack of effective emergency protocols exacerbated the tragedy. Coming up in sports, Shapar Balov ends five-year wait with Serbia Open title. Real Madrid defender Ida Militao will undergo surgery after sustaining an anterior cruciate ligament ACL tear in their 4-0 La Liga win over Osasuna on Saturday and is set to miss several months for the second consecutive season. The Brazil centre-back was injured when he hyper-extended his knee trying to strike a rebound early in the game and was in tears as he was helped off the pitch. The 26-year-old Militao became the second Real Madrid player to suffer an ACL injury this season after full-back Danny Carvajal. Real manager Carlo Ancelotti said he will be forced to resort to the club's youth academy players to fill in as injuries continue to plague the La Liga and Champions League holders. In addition to Militao, full-back Lucas Vecres and forward Rodrigo joined Real's lengthy injury lease on Saturday and Ancelotti said that he will look for solutions inside the club until the transfer window opens in January. Real were already without key players, Danny Carvajal, Thibaut Courtois, Aurelien Tuemeni, David Alaba and missing Vasquez and Militao will leave them with Antonio Rüdiger, Ferlan Mendy and Fran Garcia as the only experienced defenders in their senior squad. Now on to tennis, Denis Shapovalov of Canada ended a five-year wait for an ATP Tour title as he overcame Serbian Hamad Major Dovic to secure his second Tour title at the Serbia Open in Belgrade on Saturday. Shapovalov, who was competing in his first final since Vienna in 2022, with the home favourite 6-4, 6-4 and moves up to number 56 in the world rankings. 24-time Grand Slam champion Novak Djokovic, who pulled out of the season-ending ATP Finals through injury, presented the trophy to Shapovalov. Mezhovic was playing in his first ATP Tour final after winning the next-gen ATP Finals title last year. The 25-year-old Canadian performance indicates a strong return to form following an injury-laden 2023 season. The Belgrade Open results represents a significant milestone in Shapovalov's career revival. The Canadian's return to winning form adds another chapter to his professional development while establishing himself once more among tennis competitive ranks. Coco Golf beat China's Zheng Qinwen 3-6, 6-4, 7-6 in three hours to become the youngest player to win the WTA final since Maria Sharapova in 2004 and the first American champion since Serena Williams 10 years ago. The 20-year-old golf stormed to a 6-love lead in the final set tie-break for six championship points as she eased to victory. 
The first WTA finals title for Goff was made sweeter after a mid-year derailment when attempts to rebuild her serve led to repeated frustrations on the tour and a coaching shake-up. The youngest player to win the season-ending WTA finals since Maria Sharapova two decades ago, Goff leaves the first professional women's tennis tournament in Saudi Arabia more than $4.8 million richer and with a WTA title at every level. Olympic gold medalist Zhang seeded seven, making her WTA finals debut on the first set in just under an hour, saving all five break points she faced to keep Goff at bay. Transparent and concise. Paparan komprehensif, ringkas dan padat. Saksikan Kanta 744, 744 malam. Berita perdana 8 malam. Malaysia Tonight, 8.30pm. Up next, Bangkok Lighting and Digital Art Festival lights up City Soul Town. A major new facility for television and film production has launched on 4th November in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. With different facilities and a range of high-tech equipment, Al His Big Time Studios features seven high-tech studios and a production village with workshops and editing suites covering a 300,000 square meter studio complex according to local media. The initiative supports Saudi Arabia Vision 2030, aiming to position the kingdom as a global media hub. المجال قاعد يكبر ويوسع في السعودية بشكل غير مسبوق ونمو جدا جدا قوي ومع افتتاح الاستديوهات هذه أتوقع إنه النمو بيكون أكبر وأكبر خلال الخمس أو ست سنوات الجاية. في الموضوع عظيم يا جماعة الموضوع تخطى الخيال يعني كنا نخطط نروح الاستديوهات نصور برا وزي كذا الحين ما عاد صار لحد عذر بصراحة صار تصوير منا وفينا ومنا وعيلين. Designated to attract both Arab international creators, the studios provide comprehensive resources to reduce production costs and foster industry growth. Including advanced technology and luxurious accommodations into their package, Al Hind's Big Time Studios' goal is to set a new standard for media production in the region and expand local production's role in the entire region. Bangkok's much-anticipated annual light and digital art festival, Awakening Bangkok 2024, has officially begun and runs until 17 November, opening each evening from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. local time. Now in its seventh year, the festival invites visitors to explore the theme One Light, One Rises and experience the vibrancy and cultural depth of Bangkok's old town. The festival features 36 dazzling light installations across six main locations, including Yobdi Paman Riverwalk, Yodi Piman Market, Museum Siam, Saranron Park, Prarang Puton, Bangkok City Hall, and Romanorat Park. This event is collaboration between the Thai government and private sector partners, including the Tourism Authority of Thailand, Thailand Convention and Exhibition Bureau, Bangkok Metropolitan Administration, and brands like Yaris Atif, Nightshade, Swaps, Marimiko, and Sifa. Visitors are encouraged to immerse themselves in the installations, take memorable photos, and witness the streets of Bangkok come alive with innovative arts and lights. A wall and a subway passage plastered with passengers' post-it notes carrying inspirational commands, poignant thoughts, and uplifting ideas is many New Yorkers' answers to the fear and anxiety provoked by the election. Many of the brightly coloured sticky note address President-elect Donald Trump's win on Tuesday. Reviving's project created in the wake of Trump's 2016 victory, Subway Therapy founder Mark Chavez invites commuters at a busy Manhattan station to take time from the journey to jot a note and add it to others on the wall of a long passageway. Chavez resurrected the project, which he has taken on the road around the United States and as far afield as Brussels and Malmo on the Saturday before the election. Trump made gains across New York City, which has traditionally been a bastion of Vice President Kamala Harris' Democrats, scoring 30% of votes to Harris' 68%, which was 16 points less than Biden's 2020 tally. Tourists, business people and parents with infants were also among those stopping to read the wall and pen their own notes.
Bolivians decorated the exhumed skulls of loved ones on Friday in a colourful tradition meant to bring good fortune and protection by honouring the dead. Known as Natitas, the skulls are decorated and paraded to the cemetery a week after Saints Day. Some are adorned with sunglasses and cigarettes as well as colourful flowers and hats. The celebration of the skulls, which are kept indoors most of the year, is believed to have its roots in the Uru Chipaya custom of decentering the bodies of loved ones and the one year anniversary of their death. Today, it blends Catholicism with pre Hispanic traditions. That concludes today's edition of World Today. In our top story, Qatar suspends mediation efforts on Gaza conflict. Till then, I'm Sahih Samshidin. From river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you for watching.